So welcome everyone. This is Catherine. I'm from the Issaquah Senior Center. Uh, today is our monthly presentation with um, Overlake Medical Center. Uh, today we're, uh, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Edward Leonard and he's going to be talking about uh, vaccinations and the importance of vaccinations. So um, go ahead and take it, Dr. Leonard. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as uh, Catherine said, my name is Ed Leonard. I'm an infectious disease doctor practicing here at Overlake Medical Clinic uh, in the Infectious Disease Division. I've been here for 17 years. Um, I did my training in uh, medicine at the University of Washington and went to Stanford for my infectious disease training and then came back here to start practice uh, in 2003. As part of that uh, preliminary commentary, we, we were very much involved with the early responses to the uh, current pandemic of COVID that we're dealing with. Um, my, my goal is not to talk about that a lot, uh, but I will certainly field questions on that. My overall goal today is to talk about vaccinations in general. Why do we talk about them? How do they work? Why do they work? Um, why are they important? So. Going first, I have no relationship with any pharmaceutical companies and there is no uh, proprietary data here. So uh, this is all basic public knowledge, uh, accessible information. My goal today is to start off with what are vaccines um, and then switch to the history of how vaccines started and how long we've been doing them switch over to a little bit of cellular biology in terms of how does the immune system work in general, and then how do vaccines work within the immune system to create the immunity that we're interested in. And of course, talking about the importance of vaccines in our everyday health. Uh, and then lastly, talking about vaccines in older populations, there are certain issues we do have to address um, as we all get older in terms of vaccines and how we give them. So starting off, what is a vaccine? And I thought the simplest approach would be to find a definition in Merriam-Webster. It is a preparation of killed microorganisms, living attenuated organisms, or living fully virulent organisms that is administered to produce or artificially increase immunity to a particular disease. A lot of verbiage in there, but long story short, we expose a patient to either the live weakened organism, in most cases a, a virus, um, and the body develops an immune response to that virus, and that creates the lifelong immunity. Um, you can almost think of yourself as being infected by that organism, um, and that's how a vaccine generally works. This is a listing of vaccines that I'm sure you've heard of many of these um, that we use today. And there are certainly many others that um, I could put on this list. But some of these vaccines include tetanus, measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, as well as shingles vaccine together, pneumonia vaccine or pneumovax, hepatitis A, hepatitis B vaccines, meningococcal or meningitis vaccines, Homophilus influenza type B, which is commonly used in pediatric populations. Influenza, of course. Um, and in other vaccines, we don't use it often, like, for example, yellow fever, human papillomavirus, which causes uh, genital and, and skin warts. Polio, which we will get into during this talk a little bit later. And again, in more of a pediatric disease uh, vaccine, rotavirus. So when did we start using vaccines and how did they come to be? We can go back to about the 15th century in both China and Turkey. Um, uh, medicine men in those countries started using dried smallpox scabs to try and induce immunity, kind of like we do today. Um, smallpox, as you know, has been eradicated from this planet, and I will come back to that uh, topic as well. But that was the first organism they tried the vaccine against. And at the time they called it variolation, which is based on the name of the virus that causes smallpox, variola. 
1715, Lady Mary Wortley Montague of England pushed more for vaccines and, and vaccinating the population after she developed and survived smallpox in that year. But it wasn't until about 1798 when we saw our first scientific explorations of vaccines. And this was done by a physician in England by the name of Edward Jenner. Uh, Edward Jenner lived from 1749 and 18, to 1823. He was a physician and a scientist and made a key observation that milkmaids did not get smallpox because they had evidence of cowpox on their hands. He surmised correctly that the cowpox infected these milkmaids, leading to an immunity that protected against smallpox. So with that thinking in mind, he inoculated people with cowpox itself to protect against smallpox. And one of the reasons for this, of course, is cowpox is a much more benign disease than smallpox. So it wouldn't be as life-threatening. In doing this, he was able to successfully protect large numbers of people against smallpox. And because this was based on the cowpox virus, this process became known as vaccinations. And vaccinations root comes from Latin vaca, which means cow. And for those of you who can see the images now, I put up a picture comparing cowpox and smallpox uh, to the left images cowpox and then to the right is smallpox. As you can see, they both look very similar. They present with kind of a, uh, what we call pustules or bumps on the skin. Cowpox tend to be a little larger than the smallpox and less numerous than smallpox. The other issue, as I mentioned earlier, is that cowpox is not as life-threatening to humans as smallpox is, thus making the vaccine safe to vaccinate people. Shifting gears a little bit, we have to talk about, well, how does the vaccine work with the immune system? But before we talk about that, how does the immune system itself work? The immune system is a quite complicated uh, machinery in our body. And so it's not gonna be enough here to give you the great details, but I just wanna give you a, a background scaffolding to understand how the immune system works very generally. So the human immune system is divided into two parts. One, the first part is called the innate immune system, which is the generalized immune response to an infection, to an injury, uh, anything like that. The second part of the immune system is called the adaptive immune system. And this is a more specific response of the body to whatever problem process it's trying to fight against. And this is where the vaccines tend to do their work. So what's the difference between an innate and an adaptive immune system in terms of structurally and function? Well, the innate immune system is structural parts of our body. So for example, skin, the mucous membranes are the first level of defense of our bodies against foreign invading organisms. Our body temperature is very important in that innate immune system. The temperature goes up with the idea to not only make us uncomfortable, unfortunately, but to make it more difficult for viruses and bacteria to replicate within our bodies. Gastric acid in the GI tract is very important because if you swallow something that has bacteria or viruses in it, the stomach acid itself will start to break down those organisms and start fighting the infection that way. Then we have our generalized inflammatory response, which would include the temperatures, which would include chills and things like that, that we tend to feel, but on a cellular level starts to activate a lot of other cellular systems to start fighting infections uh, as per the talk today. The last part of that is, is called a complement system, which is actually a subset of proteins that work to, quote, complement the antibodies that are in our bodies. Uh, I will not go into great details as to how that works, but that can certainly be looked up later if you have more questions at the end of the talk. 
the adaptive immune system is the antibody side of things. This is where our body produces those antibodies to fight against particular organisms. Within those antibodies, there's also uh, two other cell types that interact with this, um, B cells and T cells. For those of you who may have taken cellular biology um, either recently or in college, would remember that B cells are the cells that produce the antibodies. T cells are more of the modulating cells, the, the surveillance cells in our bodies to help with uh, development of the adaptive immune system. So when we are immunizing patients, we can do it in two different ways. One is a passive way, which is an antibody transfer. Simply stated, we put antibodies into someone else. Um, and this can be accomplished, for example, through uh, the mother to her newborn. So as the baby gets ready to be delivered, the mother's antibodies go across the placenta and it can also go across breast milk and go into the baby. And then the baby has a complement of antibodies already. The other way we can do it is if in the office, which I have done before, is give antibody uh, products called immune globulins to a patient. So it accomplishes the same thing. We give that patient antibodies right then and there against whatever we're interested in protecting them against. Um, this is commonly used in travel patients, uh, which has been from more of my experience. Um, we can also use it for patients who have low antibody levels a condition called hypogamma globulinemia. The other way we can immunize human beings is the active way, which includes vaccination. The other way in active uh, immunization is a person getting the infection themselves. So the bulk of us have probably had chicken pox um, and depending on one's age and the like, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, to name other organisms, by getting infected with these particular infectious agents, we develop our own antibodies against them, and those last in our bodies forever. Optimally, this would be the best way to get immunity, but as you can well imagine, there are downsides to that. Namely, you get sick from the illness itself, and depending on one's health and such, they could potentially be life-threatening. So we certainly would like to be able to immunize people without putting them into that risk. This is a picture of the immune system and how it gets activated. Um, it is a slightly busy slide, so I'd like to go through a little bit what this means. And again, this is just to give you background on how vaccines work in the immune system. The first part of the immune system activation is what's called antigen recognition. An antigen is basically a protein that is used to stimulate the immune system to start developing the specific immune response. As you can see in the picture, is an, there's an antigen, and, and I put in parentheses underneath that, as a vaccine itself could be the antigen. The APC cells, what are called antigen presenting cells, take that protein, break it down, show it on the surface of itself, and then T cells, in this case, uh, what are called CD4 cells, will respond to that piece of protein. They will create um, a replication response within themselves. That leads to developing either a memory cell, which is cells that hang around in the body so that in the future can allow for a very rapid uh, uh, activation of the immune system against an organism or to develop effector cells. So in, in the left part of this screen is the third part of the immune response, which is um, a secretion of a compound called interleukin that stimulates the effector cells to become what we call polymorphonuclear cells or neutrophils, macrophages, and the like. Or they can become killer T cells, and these are cells that tend to attack cancer cells uh, and, and other uh, abnormal cells in our bodies. 
or it can become a B cell, which is where the antibodies are produced in terms of a specific cell line. Again, don't want to give you great details, but just to give you a background as to how the immune system works. So with vaccines, we have very different approaches to doing them. I have a listing of the different vaccine types we have here. I'll just uh, state a word on each type. Um, we have live attenuated vaccines, which as the name suggests, these are live vaccines with organisms that have been weakened so that they don't cause the full on disease but can still create an immune response. Classic example would be chickenpox vaccine and measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. The next type of vaccine would be inactivated vaccines. And these are vaccines that can, uh, that are inactivated completely. So they not only are they, is the immune system diminished, but they are fully uh, killed, but can still create an immune response uh, to, um, in the patient's body. So um, these are typically, so for example, uh, if we inactivate um, influenza is one way we do that. Hepatitis A is another way we do that um, in terms of an inactivated whole organisms. Then there's a group called the subunit vaccines. And what these are, these are small components of the overall organism. So basically we take a protein, put it in the vaccine, that would create the appropriate immune response to protect people against that organism. So in this example would be hepatitis B vaccine or the human papillomavirus or HPV. The fourth type of vaccine we have is, are called toxoid vaccines. These are also proteins, but they're proteins that have been uh, deactivated um, toxins from various organisms. So the, the classic example in this situation is tetanus. The bacterium that causes tetanus produces a toxin that's called uh, tetanus toxin. We take that protein, inactivate it completely, and then inject it in people, and that causes uh, the immune response. Another example for that would be diphtheria, which we don't commonly see anymore, but it also produces a toxin. We take that toxin, weaken it, and inject it in patients. The fifth type of vaccine is called a conjugated vaccine. And these are vaccines where there's a, a portion of the organism's protein that's attached to something else to, to kind of augment the immune response. The classic situation here would be Haemophilus influenzae, which is bound, interestingly enough, to the tetanus protein uh, within the vaccine. And then there's the tetanus diphtheria and pertussis vaccine itself. All three things are conjugated there. The last type of vaccine is called the DNA vaccine. This is very new. Um, as of yet, we don't have any vaccines that have been made this way, but the idea is to take the DNA sequence, the actual DNA, inject that into a patient. The patient replicates that DNA into another molecule called RNA, which leads into making a protein. That protein then leads to an immune response. Um, we're still very, very early on those stages, but HIV vaccine right now is one way of, of trying to create a vaccine against that particular virus. So going forward, there's still a little bit of a delay here, and I apologize uh, for that. But one of the uh, vaccines I, I kind of wanted to talk about um, more specifically would be um, the uh, polio vaccine. Um, polio, um, as many of you probably remember, um, was a virus that causes flaccid paralysis. So basically people became para uh, paralyzed. This virus is a member of the enterovirus family. To this day, there is still no treatment for this virus. 
um, Jonas Salk was a virologist at the University of Pittsburgh who created the first vaccine for polio in 1955. Um, and it was a live attenuated virus. So he took the virus and, and weakened it so it didn't cause disease in the patient. Um, now we use what's called the inactivated Sabin vaccine, which is a completely killed virus um, and is a lot safer. And that's what we use in the world today. One of the reasons I wanted to bring this uh, vaccine up is because one of the first ones that we had that was available to the populace. So this is a graph uh, uh, showing the number of cases that we had going back to 1937. The vaccine was introduced in 1955. And although it looks like there was a decline in cases from its peak around 1953, there was still a significant number of cases that were occurring and the uh, complications of that infection were significant. But what you can see to the right of the line of when the vaccine was created, a marked drop in the number of cases uh, to the point where essentially there are no cases in many parts of the world, which is what this slide shows. Um, and we're still working hard to try to get to the point of eradicating the polio virus in the world. So if you look at the uh, image on the upper right of this slide in 1988, you can see how much of the world was impacted by polio. Um, the United States was not one of those countries because we had such an active campaign that um, we have have not seen any active cases of what we call wild type or native uh, polio infections since the early 80s. Um, so the bulk of the world had a lot of the cases, but and when you look down at the bottom picture in 2017, we've narrowed it down to three countries that still have cases. And that's still the case in, in 2020. Um, there have been some successes in trying to get more people vaccinated, uh, but there have been a lot of difficulties, partly because of civil unrest and things like that, in, particularly in Nigeria. So we are still hopeful that someday we can completely eradicate polio from the planet. So that brings up another component of importance for vaccines. Vaccines do provide protection for the patient being vaccinated, as listed on the slide, but because the vaccine may only be the treatment available for some of these infections, that's why it becomes very important for people to be vaccinated. But the third point, as listed on the slide, is that vaccines can also lead to complete eradication of an organism. Uh, case in point is smallpox. To this day, is still the only infection that we have eradicated from the planet in terms of being in nature. Um, there are smallpox uh, supplies in research laboratories. Uh, and as far as I know, the United States and Russia um, right now, um, and hopefully it will stay that way because you can imagine if those were to get out, it would create a whole new set of, of infections because people haven't been vaccinated since the late 70s. Hopefully polio will be joining this list as a infection that is eradicated from the planet. Only time will tell, but we are hopeful that we can get there. The last thing that vaccines are important for is a societal protection. I mean, we always talk about you know, individuals, you need to get your flu shot or what have you. And that's important for the person, but the other part is a societal one, and that helps to engender a, a, a situation called herd immunity. So what is herd immunity? Um, the concept basically is protecting multiple members of society by vaccinating more people in society than who have not been vaccinated. Because if you vaccinate a lot of people, then there's a, a lower likelihood of the disease spreading through a community. Um, this next slide shows it in a, a pictorial approach. So if we look in the top third panel, you see a, um, most of the, the people representation there are blue, which means they're 
immunized, not immunized, but they're healthy. And then you see a couple of red, which are folks who are sick and contagious. So you can imagine if no one is immunized or has any immunity, the disease can spread through the population quite rapidly. Um, I mean, unfortunately, the uh, life uh, measure of this right now is the coronavirus outbreak. This is exactly what is happening today uh, throughout the world. If you get to the second set of pictures, you see that some of the uh, population has become immunized, but not quite enough yet to prevent spread, but you're starting to have some protection that can protect a few of the uh, people who have not been immunized or exposed. In the third uh, bottom of portion of the, of the slide, you see where most everyone has been immunized. Well, there still could be people who are infectious, but as you can see, you're not spreading it because the immunized population won't get the disease. Therefore, people who have not been vaccinated or gotten the disease would be relatively protected. Ultimately, of course, the hope is that the uh, non-immunized and healthy patients would be vaccinated as well. But this gives you a pictorial presentation of what herd immunity uh, entails and why vaccines are so important in this situation. So if we develop herd immunity, is there a possibility that we could uh, lose control of an infectious organism within society? And as you can imagine, the short answer is an uh, emphatic yes, we can. Do we have an example of that? Well, this is the prime example The, the measles mumps rubella vaccine was available in 1963. And if you look at that uh, graph, we had a lot of cases going up into 1964, started giving the vaccine in 1963. By 65, 66, there was a rapid drop off in the number of cases, which remained very low, getting well into the 2000s. The right side of the slide shows you what has happened since about 2010. We've seen an increase in the number of cases of measles, and, and I'm sure you've seen in the papers and on the news of outbreaks that have been going on over the past five to six years because we haven't been able to vaccinate uh, people as much as we did back in 1963 and beyond uh, up to about 2010. So we're, we're losing our herd immunity because fewer and fewer people are getting vaccinated. And so that is a prime example of what can happen when you lose the herd immunity. So how is that control loss? Um, I kind of mentioned it in this last slide, but I wanted to show you in another picture. Again, if you have incomplete herd immunity, as you see on the left side of this slide, then infected people can kind of get in and infect uninfected, non-vaccinated people much more readily, so that can allow for that disease to spread more readily in a population. But if you look on the right side, again, if, if you get more people who get the vaccine, then you can have more herd immunity and you block the ability of that organism to spread and cause disease within a population. This slide is just more of an informational representation of loss of herd immunity and control. Um, what this slide is, is showing you is kind of what the community coverage that is needed for herd immunity. On this slide, I'm introducing a, a value called the r naught, And you might have heard a little bit about it in the news, uh, talking about the uh, current coronavirus outbreak. The r naught, without getting into the math and statistics is a value that basically allows to, us to see how many people can get infected from one person who has that particular disease. So the, the numbers that are shown next to some of these diseases are the number of people who could be infected based on that infection. So if you go down that on that side, polio, um, for one person who's infected, they can infect five to seven more people. 
smallpox, even though it was very widespread early um, in the, the 20th century, actually did not cause as much disease as if you compare to chickenpox or measles, where one person who has chickenpox can infect 10 to 12 people. One person who has measles can infect 12 to 18 people. Influenza is on the lower end of that, so one person can tend to infect one to one, to one and a half uh, persons. The current COVID-19 outbreak, just as a comparison as well, we don't know yet, and we won't know for a while, but it looks like the R naught value is somewhere between 1.9 and 2.5 as of now, but the data is still being collected and analyzed. To the right on this slide is the what amount of vaccine coverage would be needed to protect the community. So if you look at polio smallpox, you need to protect 80 to 86% of the community. If you look at chickenpox and measles, you got to go a lot higher because they are a lot more contagious. So anywhere from 90 to 94% would be the optimal uh, for protecting the community. Influenza, again, a little bit lower because it's R not value is not as high, so you can get, up, you can, uh, get good herd immunity with just 80% coverage. And of course, we don't know for COVID-19 yet because we don't have any data to that end, let alone not have a vaccine yet for COVID-19. So shifting gears a little bit and to kind of uh, wind down uh, the talk for today is talking about vaccines and older patients. Um, this is an important issue from an infectious disease and molecular biology standpoint because what does age do to an immune system? Um, I like in aging, um, and I've said this to patients in my own clinic, I, I liken us aging to a car. If you have a new car, it's very zippy and, and fast. 10, 15, 20 years later, parts start to uh, wear out, it starts to slow down, and so on. I mean, it's, it's a metaphor for what we as humans do. So within that context, when you have, uh, as we get older, we can have a diminished response to various proteins, whether it's in the community or as a vaccine. Our immune system slow down. Um, it doesn't mean they can't do their job, they just slow down and are not as effective particularly with the T and B cell activation. The antibody levels over time could decrease. Um, that could be because the B cells kind of slow down and don't produce as many proteins. Growth slows down, doesn't produce as many B cells. There could be many reasons for that. Because of these issues, it becomes a challenge as to what to do for vaccinating older patients. The one thing I will say is that it's still important for uh, older patients to get vaccines. Why? First and foremost, they still provide effective coverage in general. And that's in some ways the best way to protect older patients compared to younger patients uh, in general. But it may require higher amounts of the protein in the vaccine. So for example, the higher dose influenza vaccine, which we've had for the past few years, and or multiple dosings of the same vaccine to get a good immune response. So another example within in the older population is the shingles vaccine. Um, about eight years ago, we had the Zostavax, which was a live attenuated vaccine, single dose. Um, did provide some good immunity, but the more recent vaccine called Shingrix, which is a, a, a subunit vaccine, so it's a protein portion of the virus itself creates much more immunity, but it requires two doses to get that good immune response. So that's, again, a prime example of how you can see a difference uh, in terms of vaccinating older patients. But my overall and colleagues like myself, uh, both infectious disease as well as in general internal medicine, we would still recommend vaccines for older patients in general. So to kind of recap, uh, vaccinations create immunity through stimulation of the immune system to create an appropriate immune response. I showed you a little bit of how the immune system works to create this immunity, 
uh, with on the cellular level and how they are useful for treating infectious agents when we don't have a medication or other treatments available. Also showed you that vaccines are very helpful and important in developing herd immunity in the population and that vaccination uh, given aggressively enough can lead to an eradication of uh, some organisms. There's probably some organisms we probably will never be able to do that, but um, we can certainly try going forward. And then of course, talking about vaccines and older populations, again, the key component here being um, still recommended, it may require higher doses or, uh, or multiple doses or higher concentration of protein in those vaccines. So. With that in mind, um, that's my talk for today. I will uh, happily entertain any questions uh, right now. So Joyce, were you asking a question? I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself. Okay, yeah, you okay. Good. good. Okay, how about the, the various chemos that are given for people for cancer? Um, okay, I had a round of those back in 2004, and I still have funky toes from the Taxol. This is 16 years later. When can I finally get rid of this stuff? That's a very good question. Um, in terms of the uh, answering the question about vaccinations, yeah, um, a lot of um, oncologists and, and infectious disease specialists such as myself would say that until the immune system reconstitutes itself and again, depending on what your disease is, if you're this far away from receiving chemotherapy, you could do the inactivated vaccine. So a flu shot, tetanus shot, hepatitis A, hepatitis B. Um, you can also be uh, safe in getting a live vaccine. Um, because your immune system would have been reconstituted enough at this point in time uh, to allow for that immunity. Um, so if, if you are getting chemotherapy, for example, right now, or you just finished, and we gave you a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, that could be bad because your immune system is still trying to recover, and the viruses in that vaccine could cause significant disease in you, which could be life-threatening. So right at the end of chemotherapy and the like, we would not recommend getting a live vaccine. But once the immune system again is reconstituted, you're away from the chemotherapy, then it could be considered safer uh, to give at that time. So go ahead, Joanne. I'm wondering if you have had shingles are you then immune from getting it again that's a great question um generally we think so although people can have a recurrence more than once although it's not to the frequency of for example herpes um and and just a little background herpes and chickenpox are in the same family so they act the same way so if someone develops a, uh, for example if you got shingles last year and you had bad disease, you got treated, your, your immune system was reminded of you having had chickenpox before. So right now you would have some immunity, but the question is how long does that last? Right. Um, and that's where the vaccines come into play. What we don't know, unfortunately yet, is if someone did have shingles before and we give them the vaccine, how much more protection will it give them? And those are questions we need to answer going forward as we get more experience. However, what we would all say, myself included, even if you had shingles in the past, I would recommend getting the shingles vaccine uh, on top of that to try to protect you. I mean, I'd wait at least six months to a year after your shingles outbreak, but I would still recommend getting the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm just curious um, if uh, when you think 
or even if you want the uh, COVID-19 when there might be a vaccination or I don't know if you have any insight into what's happening, but. Uh, I, I don't have direct insight, but I can say based on um, how vaccines are, are produced and tested, we may have preliminary data by the end of the year. I would be very surprised if there is a vaccine that I can say, here, I'm gonna give you this vaccine today. Mm -hmm. um, because right now they're in what's called the phase three trial of things, basically showing, does it work? Does it create a good immune response? Are there minimal side effects and those sort of things? So that takes time. It doesn't matter how quickly you can produce the vaccine, which in this case, ironically, uh, coronavirus has been faster because we have the DNA sequence and we can figure out which proteins create the immunity. So it's very easy to say, oh, we'll take that protein and make the vaccine. So that part got accelerated compared to prior years of trying to do flu shots and things like that. But you cannot speed up the clinical trials. You have to vet them through. You have to do the data analysis and do the due diligence to make sure they are safe for patients to get on a regular basis. So my suspicion is it won't be until early 2021 at the earliest before we have a vaccine. Well, I guess that's my fear that they're going to um, mm -hmm. try to rush it through and not do the thorough testing and analysis. And it's like, you know, they can't do that because, I mean, that could be a great danger to a lot of people. Exactly. And I, and I would certainly, uh, uh, be able to say from the perspective as uh, researchers, virologists, infectious disease specialists, we, we're all on the same page. Mm. None of us would want to push a vaccine that quickly just because we're in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. We want to make doubly sure that, triply sure if that matter, that the vaccine doesn't hurt you as badly as the virus itself because then right. it's kind of a moot point. Okay, well that's yeah, I mean, sometimes I hear things on the news. I'm never sure what to believe anymore, you know, so. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, yeah. I, I, can, I can assure you, and certainly from a scientific side and clinical mm -hmm. side, no one wants to rush the vaccine. Okay, that's good. At all. Yeah, let's just uh, hope and pray that, that it does come through in the early 2021. Yeah. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. So other questions, Joyce or Joanne? No, okay. You know, I yeah. I was just wondering which agency do medical professionals rely on mm. for reliable information about these vaccines? That's a great question. So uh, there's a couple. Um, there's the... Um, um, ACIP, whose initials I don't remember off the top of my head, which is a governing body that looks at the safety of vaccines and, and the, the vaccine scheduling that we have currently. Uh, the CDC is the second place that we go to uh, in terms of getting that information. Um, so those are the two big ones. In my specialty, um, infectious diseases, we also tend to hear about vaccines and such at our national meetings uh, that happen every year. Um, where, where the newest research comes out and they tell us where things are and uh, how things may change uh, for what we're doing currently. Can you recommend any specific journal that will always or, you know, have accurate information? Uh, that's a good question. Not from what you would want to do. I mean, you can, you can certainly, for example, read the Journal of Infectious Diseases or Clinical Infectious Diseases. Um, and a lot of those are really in the weeds types of, of journal articles. Um, I think certainly looking through the MMWR, which is the more the Mortality and Morbidity Weekly Report, which is done through the uh, CDC, they have um, usually once a year uh, updates on vaccines and in terms of the new schedules and the like. So I might start there. Um, and those are usually available online through the CDC website. I don't know if you have to get a subscription to get them more regularly, but I know you can read them online. That's probably where I would start in your situation. Okay. You mentioned that um, 
stomach acid is important. Mm -hmm. So if you have been on a regimen of, of Nexium or Isomeprazole yes. for a number of years, mm -hmm. how, how would that affect your immune system? I mean, would you try to find um, a vaccine that's given in multiple doses? It's a great question. Um, we, we don't know, interestingly enough, clinically, does that have an impact on an immune system response for most diseases? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of diseases aren't coming through the GI tract that we worry about. And the mm -hmm. ones that do occur, for example, uh, salmonella, uh, which can cause typhoid fever or campylobacter infections, um, those could be propagated if you're on a a drug like omeprazole. Um, it hasn't been 100% linked, but we, we think that way clinically that can occur. But for example, talking about um, rotavirus, which adults don't typically get, um, we don't think that being on a drug like omeprazole reduces your immunity uh, completely uh, from that perspective. So, so it's, it's hard to know at this point, but I, I certainly, if you need it, to take care of reflux disease, I would definitely take it. Um, and just be, we just need to be mindful and monitor you uh, in general. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. So I, I'm just curious, my mom is 86. Um, so should she continue to, again, she lives in assisted living, should she continue to get the flu vaccine? And I, I would still recommend the flu shot um, for, uh, your mom and anyone like that. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about in here with, with viral infection, we've already seen with coronavirus, but the same thing happens with influenza. Um, the patients that tend to be affected most are older patients mm -hmm. and the very young, mm -hmm. with older patients being more of, of an issue than the younger. And that's again, because being older, slowing down, that sort of thing. So I would definitely push for vaccines for the more senior populations, if, if I had to choose, if you will. Um, so I would certainly say in your mother's case, she should still get a flu shot every year. Okay, she's kind of resistant to it, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna yeah, encourage I, that. I, I've heard that more than once in my own clinical practice. Well, especially when she's living in, you know, with all those other people, I mean, it's gonna be much easier to, to right. catch things, you know? And yeah. luckily the coronavirus hasn't, hasn't uh, hit their place, so. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions you can think of? No? Okay, Dr. Leonard, this is very, uh, very informative. Yeah, I really uh, appreciate your coming and- hey, You're very welcome. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, and so we're recording it, so um, it'll be out there in a few weeks. So um, thank you so much. You're very welcome. You all take care. Oh yeah, do a okay. round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, we'll see you later. Thank you so okay. much. You're very welcome. Bye bye. Bye.